Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last session of a three-part series on artificial intelligence and elections. I am Frances Zahn with the League of Women Voters, Southwest Santa Clara Valley, and we are one of the five leagues in the Bay Area. Today's session will be recorded and the video will be posted on our League website and YouTube channel for those who couldn't join us. Um, for audience members, please mute your microphones and keep your videos turned off. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type in the chat box. We will have some time at the end to answer some of your questions. Um, before we begin, just a quick background of the League of Women Voters. The League has been empowering voters and defending democracy for over 100 years. The League is a nonpartisan political organization for women and men, encouraging informed and active participation in government. We have two distinct roles. One is voter service and public education. The other is action and advocacy. So today we are continuing our three-part educational series on AI and elections. Um, just a quick recap, in our first session, we learned some basics about AI and algorithms and how they can be used in elections to spread misinformation. In the second session, we learned how to identify misinformation and disinformation and how to fact check. So today, we'll hear more about AI and public policy. Let me introduce our two featured speakers today. First, Ms. Irina Reku. She is the director of the Internet Ethics Program at the Mercula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. She is also a member of the Partnership on AI's Working Group on Fair, Transparent, and Accountable AI. Uh, we also have Ms. Ann Ravel. She is a member of our league. She's also an adjunct professor at Berkeley Law School. Um, previously, she has chaired the Federal Elections Commission and the California Fair Political Practices Commission. So again, if you have any questions during uh, our discussion, please type them into the chat box. So now I'll hand it over to Irina and Anne. Thank you very much and uh, great to see everybody. Thank you for inviting us. I look forward to a conversation with everybody once we do um, some introductory explanation. Um, and one question we were asked to address, and maybe we'll start with that, is just, uh, is there a need for legislation and why? So I think if you attended the first two episodes of this series, you uh, realize that there is the need for legislation, at least in my opinion. I guess I should also say that um, all of the opinions I'm expressing tonight are my own and not those of the center. Um, I think there are three main reasons why we need legislation. The first one is that we've seen the very rapid incorporation of flawed products into a variety of sensitive contexts, including um, campaigns and elections. Uh, we've seen insufficient disclosure of limitations and risks by the companies deploying these tools. And we've seen insufficient understanding among the individuals and organizations adopting the tools. And um, good legislation could play an important role in addressing all three of these issues. Um, and I'll, I'll ask you for yes. your thoughts. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, we, we know that there are a number of things that are necessary to the, with the risks from AI, such as getting people's data and the like. And so in order to get compliance uh, with uh, some requirements to engage in more transparency, to consent perhaps to audits, um, and also intellectual um, property protection, all of those things will require some kind of legislation and regulations in order to get companies that are utilizing AI to adhere to the law. So um, what we're going to do between the two of us is give you a kind of a whirlwind tour among some of the legislative and policy uh, proposals and some of the measures that have been adopted already. 
Um, I just want to be clear that this is in no way going to be completely comprehensive. The situation is changing all the time. Um, and so what I hope you'll get from our presentation is primarily a sense of just how complex the regulatory environment is right now. Um, so in terms of laws and policies, and I'm going to just sort of start at the international level. Uh, you've probably all heard about the AI Act, but it was actually China that probably adopted some of the earliest uh, regulations governing AI. Um, in July 2023, an article from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace noted that China's um, three concrete regulations on algorithms are uh, on, well, NAI, are a 2021 regulation on recommendation algorithms, um, 2022 regulations on synthetically generated content, which include things like deep fakes, and 2023 draft rules on generative AI. Um, and the report from the Carnegie Endowment says that the deep synthesis regulation requires conspicuous labels be pl placed on synthetically generated content, and all three regulations require developers to make a filing to China's Algorithm Registry, a newly built government repository that gathers information on how algorithms are trained, as well as requiring them to pass a security self-assessment. So you will see, and that's a direct quote from the Carnegie um, article, you will see that some of these themes recur uh, in various proposals um, in different countries and different states. Um, in the EU, the AI Act aims to be the first comprehensive regulation of AI. It regulates different AI uses based on different categories of risk, prohibits some specific uses, and requires fundamental rights impact assessment prior to deployment of certain high-risk AI systems. It also imposes, um, according to an analysis from one law firm, transparency obligations on providers and users of certain AI systems, including providers of artificial intelligence and general purpose AI systems generating synthetic audio, image, video, or text content, um, and specifically addresses deepfakes as well. Um, in this context, um, I'm not sure how much the earlier presentations focused on voice cloning, but that is going to be a very serious issue. And often when people think of deep fakes, they think of images or videos and less often think about the video deep fakes that we're gonna be confronting. Um, just uh, in the last couple of days, it was announced that the European Commission has launched a new office to enforce the new AI rules. Um, and an article announcing its launch notes that the, quote, AI Act becomes applicable two years after its entry into force, except for some specific prov provisions. Prohibitions will apply after six months, while the rules of general purpose AI will apply after 12 months. In the meantime, the Commission will launch an AI pact, calling on developers from Europe and elsewhere to voluntarily commit to implementing key obligations of the AI Act ahead of the legal deadlines, end quote. Um, so it's interesting to see, first of all, that even some of this uh, legislation that's coming into effect um, does not actually come into um, effect in terms of enforcement for quite a long time. So in terms of the harms that we've been seeing and discussing, they remain unaddressed while the companies are still preparing for compliance. And um, we've seen in the US as well, these kind of pacts where um, companies commit voluntarily to do some compliance, but it remains to be seen how effective, if at all, these kind of voluntary pacts are going to be. Um, in the US, at the federal level, the Biden White House um, executive order on the safe, secure, and trustworthy development and use of artificial intelligence was issued in October 2023 and uh, includes a requirement that the Department of Commerce develop standards for detecting and labeling AI-generated content. Um, but I don't believe that it mentions elections specifically. Um, and uh, in late January uh, of this year, the White House released a fact sheet on progress made in the implementation of um, the executive order. 
And um, at least according to the fact sheet, a lot of the federal organizations have moved forward in complying with a lot of the provisions of the executive order. But of course, executive orders can be changed um, at the will of any new administration. <clears throat> Um, in terms of Congress and legislation, the Brennan Center for Justice's AI legislation tracker of bills introduced in the 118th Congress as of February 12, 2024, lists 70, 70 bills related to AI. None have been passed. One notable new proposal introduced by four Democratic senators last month would focus on the environmental impact of AI. The Artificial Intelligence Environmental Impacts AI Act of 2024 would have the National Institute of Standards and Technology create a methodology to evaluate the environmental consequences of AI, um, given its high energy and water consumption. Note, though, that this is mostly about transparency and that the law would apparently give uh, various departments uh, four years to submit a joint report and provide recommendations for future legislation. Um, in my opinion, that time horizon does not reflect the urgency of the issue because, especially in terms of the environmental impact, the the energy and water consumption involved, especially in generative AI, is huge, and it keeps sliding under the radar. So um, as glad as I was to see this uh, act proposed, um, I don't think it would move us forward quickly enough. Um, in terms of states, according to a tracker from the National Conference of State Legislatures, Quote, in the 2023 legislative session, at least 25 states, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia introduced artificial intelligence bills and 18 states and Puerto Rico adopted resolutions or enacted legislation, end quote. In California, there are at least 10 pending bills and two have been adopted. Um, and it's also interesting to note that on July 1st, 2019, so quite a while ago, California passed the BOT Act, BOT being bolstering online transparency. Um, the law actually, sorry, came into force on July 1st, 2019 and requires all bots that attempt to influence California's residents' voting or purchasing behaviors to conspicuously declare themselves as bots. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not sure how well this has been implemented or enforced. Um, and um, as far as I can tell, most people are not aware that the law exists. So that's another concern about legislation that might sound useful. And in this case, critics think it's too vague and it might be difficult to enforce. Um, but sometimes merely passing a law doesn't mean it's actually effective. Um, in terms of federal agencies, last August, the Federal Election Commission requested public comments on amending regulations to include deliberately deceptive AI, like deep fakes, in campaign ads. In January, the FTC's chairman said that the agency will, quote, resolve the issue by early summer. And Public Citizen published a response titled, quote, FEC's summer deadline on deep fakes rule threatens democracy, end quote. Um, again, we would be very close to elections at that point. Um, the Federal Trade Commission is acting as well. Earlier this month, it announced that it has finalized the rule banning government and impersonation fraud, and it's now seeking to extend uh, that protection to more individuals. The FTC also announced that it's, quote, seeking comment on whether the revised rules should declare it unlawful for a firm such as an AI platform that creates images, video, or text to provide goods or services that they know or have reason to know is being used to harm consumers through impersonation. Um, so that is an interesting comment that brings us to the firms that uh, deploy these products. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we also mention company policy, since we are talking about policy as well. Companies make their own rules um, internally, um, 
sometimes. So on that note, in January, OpenAI, the developers of ChatGPT and related services, announced that politicians and their campaigns are not allowed to use the company's AI tools. That's according to one of their blogs. Um, and CNN reported that the restrictions also extend to impersonation, but that various other companies um, have made different kind of comments. So Meta last year said it would bar political campaigns from using generative AI tools. Uh, YouTube announced that it would require content creators to disclose their videos that feature manipulated but realistic media. And the CNN reporter um, commenting on all this said that the various sets of rules, which cover different types of content creators are under different scenarios, underscored that, quote, there is no uniform standard governing how artificial intelligence can or should be used in politics. So that's my little whirlwind tour, and I'm going to ask Anne to fill in all the gaps that I know exist in between all of those categories. That that was an excellent whirlwind tour. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, let me talk a little bit first about um, Congress, because uh, uh, Irina is correct. They have not passed anything of any um, substance to deal with the issues related to AI. But I need to tell you that the legislators in Congress have not been um, entirely asleep at the switch um, because a lot of people are concerned about how to address AI, um, in particular with regard to issues of disclosure requirements, watermarking, which also Josh Becker recently introduced a bill in California requiring that there be watermarking of all um, matters that are done with AI so that people will know what the source is and not really believe that there is a deep fake or the like. So that's one of the big issues, as well as intellectual property, because a lot of people are concerned about the use of intellectual property by AI and how that's going to be impacting their businesses or their own um, work. Um, and so I can tell you um, in May of 2023, Amy Klobuchar, Cory Booker, Michael Bennett, who's from Colorado, um, together with a Congresswoman, Yvette Clark from New York, um, introduced something called the Real Political Ads Act, which would dis require a disclaimer on political ads that use images or video uh, generated by AI. And that's uh, similar to what you were talking about, about the Federal Election Commission and what they were looking for um, and the concern, I know I was on the Federal Election Commission, and there is a concern there about free speech issues and, and what kinds of things they can regulate. But that's yet to be seen what, what would happen. Um, but also Ted Lieu uh, from California, um, Ken Buck from Colorado, Anna Eshoo, who's now stepping down, and another uh, um, congressman, Brian Schatz from Hawaii, uh, introduced the National AI Commission Act, which would create a bipartisan blue ribbon commission to recommend steps to AI regulation. Because it is true, a lot of people are saying, it's one thing to have laws about it or have some regulations, but unless there's some way of enforcing them, it's going to be very difficult to actually make any real change in this arena. So that's kind of um, what's been going on. A lot of people have introduced bills. And with regard to states, um, this is probably more information than anybody wants uh, about the states. But um, since 2019, 17 states have enacted 29 bills that were focused on, and this came also from the Council of State Governments, uh, regulating the design, development, and use of artificial intelligence. And they 
primarily deal with regulatory concerns of data privacy and accountability. And so there have been basically a number of bills introduced that were leading the charge in this issue um, in California, in Colorado and Virginia to require uh, regulatory and compliance frameworks for AI systems. Um, but uh, even with all the congressional hearings that were held and the bills that were uh, that were suggested, you know, nothing has passed um, in these. And so establishing regulatory compliance in the states seems to be a really good mechanism for dealing with it. And in particular, California, for example, because we are the heart of uh, Silicon Valley and the view is that we're the ones that can actually make some change. And I know there was a recent bill introduced by Senator Ashby, who I do not know who that is, um, but she uh, introduced a bill, or he, um, SB 970 relating to artificial uh, intelligence uh, technology, also talking about the issues of existing law that prohibits false impersonation of another person in either their personal or official capacity with the intent to steal or defraud. And those are the definitions in the bill about terms related to AI and synthetic voice, video, image recordings, etc. These are some of the things that cause people the most grief about, and that is true in particular in the electoral area, which is I think where some of the big concerns of AI exist, more so than just in policy. But what the bill, the California bill would require, and it hasn't passed as far as I know, but it would require the Judicial Council to develop and implement screening uh, procedures for records that are introduced as evidence to identify whether or not they are syn synthetic. And it would require the council to develop and promulgate educational materials to assist in the identification of evidence that has been tampered with due to artificial intelligence. And as well as a requirement of the Department of Consumer Affairs um, to specify consumer warnings, um, and then they would um, impose a civil penalty for violations and failure uh, to do that. So um, these, these bills are all pretty similar in, in intent and what people are concerned about. I mean, I think, Irina, you could probably speak to that too. I think everybody is worried about some of the, the possibilities of theft of people's personal information and various other things. Um, and I also wanted to mention, because um, as we discussed, I've been spending a lot of time looking at these things. Um, it's in Europe, and yes, of course, uh, e the EU laws are, are preeminent, but um, Italy also, they have a data protection agency and they banned chat GPT there um, and initiated a, a, a probe into suspected breach of privacy concerns. Um, and they basically used privacy law to look at these issues of uh, general data protection regulations and the like. Um, and Spain has done the same thing. They've done actual investigations into data bre breaches by chat GPT. Um, and they also you know, relied on the uh, EU's privacy watchdog uh, to look at those concerns. France did the same thing, I guess, chat GPT, nobody likes. Uh, apparently they're being investigated all over the world. Um, so they, in fact, the privacy watchdog 
um, announced a task force on specifically chat GBT, uh, GPT that would quote, foster cooperation and to exchange information on possible enforcement actions conducted by data protection authorities. Because that's that comes down to why we need to have regulations or legislation in, in some way to be able to look at these issues and make sure, because one of the things, and, and I'm sure, Irina, you can talk to this better than I can about the big picture, but you know, not everything that's said about AI is problematic, is right. I mean, if people seem either distressed that it actually exists and all these problems that can accrue because of it. On the other hand, there are a lot of things about it that are good. But what we haven't talked about in terms of policy that a lot of people are worried about, it's use in a discriminatory fashion, for example, um, if they're, it's going to be used in companies for hiring or the like, if they are discriminating against women or discriminating against people of color, and that that may be something that a lot of people are really worried about, that that not just the issue of transparency, but the fact that it is being used um, in ways that is um, improper. Absolutely. And and I, I would add that I was trying to sort of stick as closely to the issue of, uh, of uh, elections related policy, just because we could yeah. talk for hours about all the various policy issues, um, you know, raised by by AI tools um, to add a little bit to what Anne just said. Um, Actually, in response to the Italian investigation, um, OpenAI changed some of its practices and uh, is now allowed again in Italy, as far as I know. Um, but as a result of the pushback by the by the Italian privacy agency, um, OpenAI basically allowed users to choose to have their communications opted out of training future models um, of chat GPT. So two things happened because of that. One was that people got some new rights that they hadn't had before. And another was the whole transparency issue because until then, um, if you would have asked me, I wouldn't have known to tell you whether they were using the prompts that people were putting in in order to train the model. So that's how we found out that they were after the Italian investigation. And it's been very interesting to see how um, the privacy laws in Europe have actually provided, and, and, and some of the laws in the United States, some of the things that the FTC has done has been using existing U.S. law to push back against some of the, um, you know, more concerning um, uses of AI. And I completely agree that not all uses of AI are negative. Um, I think um, we're talking here about why regulation might be needed, and regulation is often needed to control the negative aspects. But there's also regulation and policy and sections, for example, in the executive order from the Biden White House that are actually about, you know, building the new uh, workforce that will be able to work in AI and, and making sure that we are competitive in AI. So um, not all the rules are about saying no to, to excesses and to problems. They're also very much about making sure that we keep up with any competitors. Um, and that we have the right expertise to to do what we need to do with AI. Um, I would also say that I I didn't mean at all, you know, to suggest that that Congress is not interested and active. And I think the fact that there are seventy bills, you know, in progress says a lot. Um, it's just that they haven't passed. So I think there is there is a lot of concern and a lot of push for legislation. And I think we will see. Some more specific, some of the more specific ones potentially passing, and in the meantime, state laws, like Anne said, and in particular California's, are hugely influential, and they may become the de facto law, you know, the, the that's of application around the U.S. Whatever California passes often has that effect. Um, really briefly, 
a couple more things. One is that we've already seen election misinformation in other countries' elections. So this is not just a hypothetical. This is happening elsewhere. And so American companies and their policies and their products uh, can do good things around the world, but can also cause real harm around the world, including to democracies in other countries. Um, and on the issue of watermarking, which everybody really wants, my concern is that what I hear from technologists is it's defeatable. So it's, it's still useful and we should have it um, because at least some of the concerns would be handled by that, by, but bad actors can get rid of the watermarks, can, can work around them. So um, the, the concerns will remain even if we pass laws that require watermarking. So let me give you all just um, as a matter of interest, the, the states that have um, focused bills on data privacy and accountability. And that is California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Louisiana, Maryland, Montana, New York, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, surprisingly, Vermont, Virginia, and Washington. Um, so it's kind of amazing how reactive states have been to this issue um, so quickly. And many of them also, aside from data privacy and the like, and transparency, which are all issues that everybody is concerned about, many of them, a number of legislatures have come up with, okay, we're gonna set up a commission or a group to be able to analyze these issues and deal with them about whether or not they they can um, Im, import or impact them with um, some kinds of fines or wh whatever else. So everybody is trying to figure out the way how to, how to assure compliance. Um, but also there's a number of states, including California, Colorado, and Illinois that enacted legislation relating to AI to protect individuals from discrimination. So, and to assure that all AI systems are designed in an equitable way, including algorithmic discrimination, um, where as, as it's defined in AI system contributes to the unjustified different treatment of people based on their race, color, ethnicity, sex, religion, or disability, among other things. Um, so it's really interesting how there's a confluence between, you know, the concerns about AI generally, but also about issues of social justice relating to, to AI and it, the desire for accountability from uh, the, the various AI um, companies. So um, it is clear that according to what, what the states group says is that they think that this, um, the number of, of uh, bills proposed and enacted in state legislatures has grown exponentially, uh, it really large. And they think it's, the trend is gonna continue. It's gonna continue to be looking at these issues. Um, and that it was California, Colorado, and Virginia that laid the groundwork for this, for AI, especially about data privacy, uh, which seems to be the biggest focus of a lot of the concerns. I will say the the other big focus is um, again the the call for far greater transparency in terms of what data has been used to train the models and what is being you know done with with the various models. Um, you know, as I said, the environmental impact of the various models. There's um, you know uh, a push from legislators to just help. Um, 
you know, all of us understand more about what these tools really are. And, and that's the part that I think is really needed because again, we've heard so much of, of the hype about what they're going to do. And it's been up to like activists and journalists to uncover the limitations and explain them to the rest of us. And that's not how this should work, especially when they're really incorporated into such sensitive areas. Um, it's also interesting because I think we're all talking a lot lately about generative AI, but of course, other types of AI have been around for a long time and have been incorporated um, by various entities, including states for a long time. And on that note, uh, there have been states who have been sued for deploying algorithmic tools that were not really you know, fit for the purpose. So um, a number of years ago, for example, the state of Michigan uh, deployed a system called Midas, which was supposed to um, find out and kick off the welfare rolls, people uh, who were committing welfare fraud. And a lot of people were kicked off the welfare rolls. And after a few years and complaints, the algorithm was tested and it turned out that it had a higher than 80% false positive rate. So think about a system deployed at that scale, at the scale of an entire state and on the most vulnerable people who are on welfare and allowed to run for several years before it's tested and found to be just egregiously bad. Uh, of course, class action lawsuits followed. Of course, it took like almost 10 years for any resolution and it will not make those people whole people went bankrupt who had done nothing wrong so there really has to be a lot more care including by states and deploying these kind of things yeah and if i can also add to what you were talking about about campaigns and the use in campaigns i mean we all know from 2016 on um, there has been a surge of misinformation on social media and other mechanisms. And a lot of that was used with algorithms. Um, as we know, much of it, um, much of the false information and uh, pretending to be someone, but not actually that person, um, much of it came from Russia and from, <laughs> during the 2016 election. And subsequently, it's been a very common problem and the issues of disinformation and misinformation online have already created really serious problems in our democracy. And that's one of the things that's kind of interesting about this because of course, AI has the capability of doing that as well, but it's not like it hasn't been done previously. Definitely. So one of the things we were also asked to discuss was the difference between legislation and policy. And I was wondering, Anne, whether you wanted to take that on. Jump on. Well, I think that, that a lot of legislation, even though it's enacting laws or, or then um, empowering agencies to enact uh, regulations, um, meant most of that in this instance is related to public policy. It just is because you're going to have governments that are going to be asserting the need as we talked about it in for anti-discrimination, for other um, transparency of various issues and who's behind it. All of those things are partly public policy and it will be public policy if it's um, governments that are particularly state governments, but even what Biden had said when he was talking about the issues of AI. I mean, I think all of that is about public policy and it's not really specifically about, okay, we have to um, enact uh, legislation that's going to um, punish people who are doing certain things. It's more about we, we want to assure that our democratic process and that our country is being um, uh, as open, transparent, and, and that uh, those laws are really 
um, going to be a way to assure that the public is not mis misled by issues. And that, so I, I think there is a, a difference between the two. Um, what I would add to that is that it seems like some of the laws being proposed are really about um, creating the kind of transparency and allowing us to have the information necessary to even develop public policy. You can't do that without having some of these details be clear to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I would say very broadly is that policy is, of course, about a course of action or principles and having some consensus um, and legislation requires, I think, a broader consensus and is codified and it's enforceable and it's harder to change. So policy can be sort of a, a more flexible way of addressing this, but it's not really necessarily enforceable. Um, organizations can just, just change their policy. And so I think we need um, we need policies developed where, where all kinds of organizations and, and communities at various, you know, of various layers of democratic involvement develop their policies around how they want to handle AI. But we also need actual enforceable laws that require uh, particular actions or prohibit particular things. Um, and that would be harder to to change or to, you know, we, we've seen companies, for example, do things like um, after the last um, election, I believe, or maybe before ahead of the last election, do things like put policies in place that banned political ads and then um, decide that maybe it wasn't so good for business and just reverse those policies. And it wasn't at all clear why, you know, what the, what the policy reasoning was for, for reversing them. And I think that's why we need legislation where, again, you know, it reflects more of the desires of the broader community and all of us as citizens living with um, these new tools. Agreed. So I believe that our hostess, Frances, was going to um, suggest questions for us from the audience. Yes, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, first, um, you had mentioned uh, the EU had the first comprehensive AI um, act. So one of the question is, do the laws passed in the EU have built in strong regulatory obligations or in other words, can they be effectively enforced? Um, I mean, I think those are two separate things. I think they do have, um, sorry, what was the regulatory, what was the term used? Uh, regulatory obligations, strong regulatory obligations, or they, I guess, they, how can they be enforced? So they do have strong regulatory obligations, but in terms of enforcement, there's been um, a lot of complaining that they were not being enforced quickly enough as well. So I think in general, um, it, it's taken a lot for us to see laws passed. And then once they are passed, of course, there's kind of a grace period when companies are given time to comply with the laws. Um, and then the whole enforcement process can take a really long time. But we are starting to see um, the EU um, enforcing those laws. Um, another question here is for uh, both of you. What do you both see as the potential impact of AI on the upcoming election in 2024, particularly regarding trust in election-related institutions? Well, if uh, I would say there's already a lack of trust in election-related institutions, unfortunately, uh, and a lot of the people who are uh, the ones who are the working for the secretaries of state or the actually doing the work uh, have been attacked and mistreated, thinking that uh, what has been said previously in the elections, that everything is fraudulent, which is not true. Um, and so people are worried about AI and its use mainly about uh, 
the impersonation of people and false information, which is why the FEC wanted wanted to um, have some regulations that would deal with those issues because we already have a problem with trust in this country and in the electoral process. And this is something that could um, exacerbate that problem, unfortunately. So I do worry about it, but then I just, you know, have to admit, I just generally worry about 2024 <laughs> in general. So, um, you know, it, but it, it is, uh, possible also because um, a lot of those fake videos and other other uh, other things that are produced uh, people don't have the wherewithal to be able to know who's really behind them and what the real truth is and whether that is really the candidate or not or whether it really is the you know election observers or you know so it's that's a, that's the kind of issues that i think people worry about with ai yeah i mean i would add that we've already seen a lot of misinformation around elections um that you know video and images and sound could already be manipulated and had been and what AI does is, you know, make it easier to do, make it easier to do at scale and faster and to deploy even more personalized versions of all of these things. But, but you know, we were, we were already struggling with how to answer misinformation, especially in a context where scholars tell us that people often they're not they're they're sort of willing to suspend disbelief for things they want to believe and then they will believe very you know uncredible things about the other side and so we've gotten to a point where we're so polarized that we are you know easily misled and we then participate in this and you know mislead each other by um you know, sometimes sharing things and, you know, very kind of knee-jerk reaction and then finding out later that they were actually false or incomplete, or again, it doesn't really take AI to to create the, that kind of messaging. I think we all have a role to play in just slowing down and being more critical and, you know, double checking everything, um, especially before we share things ourselves. Yep, those are definitely the um, the same uh, points our, our previous speakers had, had mentioned. We have to make sure how we interact online um, with the information that we're given, uh, not only in, in forwarding, but even clicking on something. Um, it, it's interacting with the algorithm in the background. You know, which, um, is, which is a lot to ask of people who are yes. busy and worried about their jobs and their kids and transportation and inflation and everything else, right? So I think this does mean that, again, um, the companies that are putting out the tools that enable this are imposing a cost on all of us that is really not being considered enough. We we'll have another question here about um, Assembly Member Pellerin's bill targeting deep fakes. Um, if you know anything about that bill and what do you think about that? I'm not familiar with the specific bill and so I can't really comment on that. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I didn't know that. I actually just had an event for Assembly Member Pellerin at my house and she didn't speak about that bill. So I did not know that she had introduced a bill. But, you know, with respect to that, I think it is really a, a good thing to be able to enforce um, a law which is trying to attack deep fakes, because that's one of the things. And, you know, Irina, you, you, you said it perfectly about how people are easily led into believing some of these issues, whether it's online or whatever, because it's just so common now. And many people are not sophisticated enough to determine that the difference. So I, I'll take a look at what her bill is, but I'm pretty sure it's good. I like her. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's trying to do the right thing. 
All right. It's, yeah, it's we... hard here. As as I mentioned during that earlier whirlwind tour, I mean, it's yeah. basically impossible uh, unless somebody does this, you know, for their job all day long to just keep up with all of the various laws and bills being proposed. And for, for my purposes, I basically got to the point where I mostly wait and look at things that pass uh, rather than what's being proposed. Yeah, yeah, we we know AI is uh itself is moving quickly. There are changes coming out, and then the legislations and policies that are being uh, discussed are also moving very quickly. There's something new every day. Um, so there we have another question here that's asking. It's been said that by the time legislation is crafted, passed, and implemented, that the regulations may be outdated. Would it be wiser to focus the legislation on broader areas like transparency? I don't think they're always outdated. I think it depends on how they are drafted and they can be broad enough and not necessarily just about broad issues like transparency. I, I think they can be um, enforced even when they're more specific requirements in the law. And, and I think they are needed. So um, I would push back against the notion. I mean, we have, you know, we have environmental laws. We have laws about all kinds of things. It's not like we haven't regulated industries before and they seem to function as intended, imperfectly, but function. So I think we can do the same kind of thing with AI. I would also say that there are a number of, of agencies and let's say attorney general's offices that are putting out guidance um, that are trying to say, okay, while the laws are being hashed out or we know until we figure out how they're being enforced, this is what you as a company, for example, can do uh, to prevent enforcement against you, to, to kind of come into compliance without having to go through that kind of investigation. And those kind of uh, guidance documents can be more flexible and change more quickly to match what's out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think that, I mean, clearly, uh, if the laws change to require absolute transparency that you that are it's written to ensure that they will be by clearly informing the the people about how it's collected, um, how it's going to be used, how their data is being protected um, by the AI systems. If there's more detail about that and in the requirements, I think it's going to definitely be helpful to the public to know that, which is one of the, and I know you, you talked about the watermark, but it's one of the things, as long as people are alerted to a lot of these issues, um, it could be um, maybe not a panacea, but a lot better. Um, other than AI, we have another question here about when ads or flyers are mailed via the U.S. postal system with misinformation or disinformation, does that violate anything like federal, any federal statutes? No, <laughs> there, it, they do not, it does not. And I'll tell you why, because of the U.S. Supreme Court and how they've interpreted the First Amendment so broadly that it permits all kinds of falsehoods that can misdirect people and make them vote differently or believe certain things that aren't true, uh, but it's protected speech under under this, this particular Supreme Court's decision-making. It's interesting. I should, on on a totally different note, I should add that I've seen, um, you know, some folks suggest using AI, trying to figure out how to use AI to, let's say, increase voting and participation. Um, I'm not sure that I've bought that as a successful effort. Um, and I think it's really interesting, again, if we uh, if we consider the environmental implications of using these tools um, and the whole notion of balancing benefits versus harms, um, I, I think it's really important that we ask for evidence of the benefits before we um, implement anything that might cause harm. 
Uh, we just saw a comment here from uh, one of our members, Tom, um, about uh, Assembly Member Tolerance Bill AB 2839 about uh, elections that deceptive media in advertisements um, was introduced last week to address AI and audio deepfakes before and after elections. And I'm glad to see, as I mentioned, I'm glad to see audio mentioned because it's been sort of left behind. And we just saw recently the the faked voice of, you know, faux President Biden, right, um, telling electors not to vote in a in a election. So um again this is this is happening already and this is why i'm 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 concerned about how slowly the response is coming to to things that are impacting our elections right now so there was a uh, recent uh law from the S fcc just this month that bans uh fake audio or AI generated audio in robocalls for political campaigns. Do you know anything about that one or is it effective immediately? Or can you tell us anything about that? And that, was, you know that was, you said from the FEC? FCC. FCC, oh, that's yes. what I figured. Uh, having been at the FEC, I know they never <laughs> could up with anything that they agreed on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was surprised. Yeah, the FCC could have that that um, ability to have that kind of regulation. So all I know is that it passed. I don't know okay. if it comes into effect um, right away or, yeah. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, thank you, uh, Irina and Anne, um, for sharing your knowledge with us and shedding some light on this rapidly evolving um, topic. Uh, I know AI is gonna be something that's gonna be um, uh, in our conversation, in our minds every day going forward. Um, and Sophia, can you put up our last slides? Um, can before I we add go? one, one oh, yeah, more thing? Since um, you mentioned at the beginning, the advocacy role of the League of Women Voters that um, and, and the education aspect, the fact that all of the folks listening on the call now and who listened on the two prior um, parts of this series can play both an advocacy and an educational role in sharing whatever they learn from all of these with other people that they know. And it's really important because there's a lot of misinformation out there or just lack of information out there about AI. So you can become sort of uh, educators yourselves uh, for others, that that would be hugely important and helpful. And, you know, can I just say one more thing, knowing that um, Irina is with uh, the Markala Center, and I, too, I'm on the board of the Markala Center, but um, we, it's good for you to say, this is a question of ethics. It really is at its core then that's what we've been talking about. And that's what's important in an electoral process as well. So most definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, for audience members, um, the recordings of this session and the two previous sessions will be on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, and we will post a link uh, quickly. Uh, first of all, um, this slide is a um, just a few resources if you'd like to get more information um, about AI, media literacy, or um, ways to fact check. Uh, these are a few useful websites. Um, AINU and MediaWise are the uh, two previous um, speakers who came to our previous sessions. And um, some of these websites listed here were also suggested by audience members for, from our two previous sessions. We hope these will be useful for, for you all. Um, and then next, since we have our primary election coming up on March 5th, we always wanna share a few nonpartisan election uh, information resources with you as well. So that would be useful for you as you do your research on candidates and propositions. Um, especially this first uh, website listed here, Vote411. <clears throat> it's very easy to use. If you put in your registered address, it will give you a personal voter's guide with all of the information that are specific to your ballot. So we hope you put these trusted 
resources to use. Um, we know there's a lot of misinformation around this, but please remember some of these trusted resources that we can always go to. Um, feel free to take a screenshot of this uh, of the resources slides so you can use them later. Uh, and then next, if you enjoyed the program today, we invite you to join us as a member by going to our website. And this website is also where you can find links to all of our past events um, and that can link you to the, the video recordings of our events. And you can also go to uh, YouTube and search for uh, League of Women Voters, Southwest Santa Clara Valley. We do have a YouTube channel. All of these recordings are listed on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you would like to support us and our programs, you can donate by scanning this uh, QR code and your donation is tax deductible. We are an organization run by volunteers and we support any support, uh, we su uh, appreciate any support from the community. And we thank you again um, to our speakers for sharing their knowledge with us today. And I also wanna thank the rest of our team who worked on organizing the program uh, on AI and elections, Eileen Cow, Sophia Cow, and Ele Eleanor Ick. Thank you all. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Is that vote? <laughs> Remember to vote. <laughs> Any last comments from our speakers or our team? Thank you, Francis. You did an excellent job of moderating. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Irina. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You everybody. And I don't know if you saw it, but I was holding up my little I voted sticker. So. Oh, great, <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. I voted I was... the day that the ballot came to my house. Wow. And it was I... <laughs> amazing that the registrar the very next day said my vote was counted. Wow. Yep. I will do that this weekend. Everyone else, please remember to vote. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our program today. Nine.